Welcome to the Terry Sullivan Show. Will you please give it up? Terry Sullivan. That's my good friend, Judge. That's Terry V on the guitar. Man, can he play. I pretty much taught him everything I know. It was a 10 minute truck. <laughs> I need some of that. <laughs> I know. Somebody said to me, oh, by the way, welcome. My first guest is Judge Oliver, Chance Oliver, and I'm so glad he's here. Good friend of mine, eats a lot of ribs, if that's okay. He needs to hold up on those a little bit. But I'm so glad he's here. Judge, it's good to have you. Thanks for inviting me. Well, I'm glad you're here. We're gonna get into some good stuff here in a minute, but that's Terry V on the guitar over there. Somebody told me, they said, you sure are boring, you need some music. So I brought in a good, a good musician. Music judge, always helps, I think. Explain your job as a judge? Well, my job as a judge, you know, there's a lot of us up there at the courthouse, but mine's very specific, uh, similar to a lot of other judges, but, uh, you know, different in some aspects is where I am a county criminal court judge handling mostly criminal court cases as the name uh, states, but also do a little bit of civil if, uh, say, Judge Ramirez is conflicted out of a case. I'll oh, handle by the that. way. Judge Ramirez <clears throat> told me that if it doesn't go well, call him and he'll be right here. Oh, to finish it up? Yeah. Okay. I'll, uh, I know he can get here pretty quickly because we've come down here for lunch a time or two. But uh, so yeah, if there's a civil case that he's conflicted out of, I'll handle it because uh, before I was a judge, I did a lot of civil as well as criminal, real estate, all kinds of other things. But uh, you know, the the biggest thing that separates me from some of the other county court, county criminal court judges is I have this, uh, like we discussed, uh, like a mental health uh, caseload or a grant that I'm in charge of. When I say in charge of, I'm just supervising uh, one, one young lady that kind of uh, handles all that, the most, most of it, and I just kind of uh, direct her and uh, support her in that area and it's all about you know trying to keep these people with mental health issues and um, out of jail and into treatment if we can these are nonviolent offenders that are misdemeanors usually probably 90 percent criminal trespass trying to keep them out of jail and getting in more trouble when they get in jail which is usually bad news so when you so so when you're you have a case here's a loaded question okay so you have a case you're sitting on the bench you're listening to both sides plea the case. Is there ever a time or are there lots of times when you go, this person's probably going to jail? Do you, can you make a, a judgment that quick? Well, generally, I don't have very many decisions like that that come before me. I'm normally doing plea bargains or there's a trial and um, the jury would decide, you know, guilty or not guilty. And then oftentimes they'll say, uh, we want uh, the judge to determine the punishment. And I think I've only done that maybe twice. They generally, after a jury would return a verdict of guilty, they'll work it out at that point. Uh, very rarely do they not work it out. So yeah, there's definitely uh, sometimes when I, uh, it kind of happened to me last week, whereas I have more opportunity or there's sometimes uh, necessity of me to say this person's going to jail when I have someone that's on bond for DWI, especially DWI second, and they continue to violate their bond with like drinking and their interlock, their breath machine on their car showing drinking or they're testing positive for drugs, whether they have an interlock, a patch, uh, scram device, something like that. Like I had somebody come in last week and I'm like, like you just said, I'm thinking this guy needs to go to jail. And I don't tell them that, but I say, you guys should really try to work something out with that case. And of course, on DWI second, you have to do some jail time. So do you think, of it. right. So do you think sometimes, you know, <clears throat> jail time will help this person get, uh, get on track or jail time will help this person uh, go a different direction that's better. You ever think that way? Oh, for sure, and, and I've, seen it, I've seen it happen, uh, whether that was as a prosecutor or as a defense attorney, where I've had certain people that are like, this person really needs uh, some time in jail, maybe not necessarily the jail, 
but more importantly, the separation from the freedoms that they enjoy on the in the free world or in, on the streets. You know, and I'll, I'll say free world because I, you know, I don't know if I told you, but I was a prison guard for almost five years before I became a lawyer. That's what I did in college. So I heard a lot of the prison lingo. So when I'm tell, talking to someone about jail or prison, because I do sometimes tell people you're headed to prison if you keep this up and you don't want to be in prison because I kind of know a thing or two about prison. Um, yeah, I've had, I actually had a lady and she was pregnant and she kept violating bond, DWIs, DWIs, violating bond and she was on probation and she was getting revoked and it was a matter of does she need to go to jail? And she was pregnant on drugs. And I'm thinking, she needs to go to jail to teach her a lesson and also for the safety of the baby. It's kind of what I was thinking. You know, so yeah, there's definitely uh, sometimes uh, that I think that's necessary. And she went to jail. She had her baby right after she got out of jail. And that was intentional on my part, kind of on the timing and their baby's healthy and everything was great. So yeah, there's another, there's a real life situation where I think that jail time was good for more than just her, but. So, so Judge, you said you were a, a, a prison guard. That's interesting to me because I never knew that about you. There's a lot of stuff I don't know about you. That we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna dig in a little bit because Blanca told me, she gave me a lot of bullet points. No, I'm just kidding about that. I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding about that. But as a prison guard, what, what, uh, what kind of prison was it? Well, that's, uh, people often ask me that. I actually worked three different units and uh, they're like, people would say, was that a close custody? Was that a, you know, uh, bad unit? All units, they're made to keep you in, right? And uh, I started out on Ellis Two, which has been renamed Estelle, but then I moved over to Ellis One, which is where they housed Death Row. Uh, and both of my little brothers worked death row at the same time I did. Every now and then I would go down there and fill in for something. But, uh, and then I finished my time, that's what I tell people, on Darrington unit, which is south of Houston. Uh, so I was on three different units. They were all, especially Darrington, was a very close custody rock and roll unit, they called it, which is where guys had been, got in trouble. And the other two units I was on, I got sent down there. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, I was, uh, and I worked the rec department, so I worked all kinds of different things. And, uh, and then I, I retired or, or resigned from there and went straight to law school. Prisoners that are on, on death row, what generally is the attitude in, in that? I don't even know what you call it, that block, row? Yeah, what, what well, it's called death row, you know, and it used to be in uh, Huntsville. Now it's up in Livingston is where they actually keep uh, death row. But... Uh, they never, very rarely did we have any more problems from those guys than we did regular guys. You know, some of those were the most laid back guys you would, you would ever imagine. Because when you take away drugs and alcohol and everything else, uh, most of them are pretty normal, mm -hmm. I would say. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, there's definitely. So, you, so you're, you're on death row. I mean, does it, does it just kind of sink in that, hey, I'm done anyway, so I might as well just lay back and and let it come. You do have guys like that, but you also have guys that are gonna fight though, you know, the entire entire time. Cause you know, there's been times where those guys have escaped or tried to escape and actually been out uh, before, you know? So yeah, some of them are, some of them just relax and say it's gonna come and others are gonna fight every day to get out, so. What's the worst thing that happened while you were a prison guard? You know, I didn't have to be involved in too many uh, crazy things. I just saw, you know, fights, you know, guys beating up guys because if, you know, someone's getting beat up in a, a cell, I don't run in there and save them. You know, I call for backup and, you know, it's going to be what it's going to be. But I saw some pretty tough beatings, you know, cellmate on cellmate. Generally, if it was out in the hallway, mm -hmm. uh, I, didn't, I didn't see anything too crazy. And if there was a use of force or something, I, I fortunately never had to initiate one, mm -hmm. but there were some times where I had to but jump on you? a leg or something on that, like that. And that, that kind of activity, is, it doesn't bother you? I mean, you know, when I see a fight, I can't watch these, uh, the, the, what do you call it, UFC? I can't watch that because I, it, 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 it bothers me. It bothers me that guys are just beating on each yeah. other and, and nobody really wins. Even the winner's all messed up, you know? Yeah, yeah. It doesn't bother you? 
Well, you know, it's not something you want to do every day, but, you know, it's just part of the job. As long as I wasn't getting beaten up, you know, I'd do my best to to get the people there and, and stop the situation. But, yeah, I didn't, my heart wasn't, uh, you know, yeah. too heavy on that when I'm talking about, you know, two guys in prison yeah. fighting. So you're a prison guard, and what, did you just wake up one day and go, you know what, I think I'm going to go to law school? You know, I did. It was because uh, I went to... Sam Houston State University. My sister was there, but they also had the best law enforcement criminal justice program, the oldest and the best at the time for sure. And I wanted to be a cop. That's all I ever wanted to be was a cop. And uh, I went to, went to college, got out of college with, you know, almost five years of experience in prison. Well, I only had four then. Uh, I could not get a job as a cop. I just, it was very difficult. That was the time in 1992 where things were just different. It wasn't, you know, all of us guys were getting out of college, going to Houston Police Department, and then couldn't get hired there for various reasons. And then we went over to uh, the fire department. We're like, let's be firemen. They're like, why are all you, <laughs> why are you criminal justice guys applying to the fire department? Yeah. We're like, well, we can't, get to, we can't get hired over there at the police department. They go, we have the same uh, hiring requirements here that, you have, that they have over there. By the way, if you if you still want to be a police officer, I think there's plenty of job openings. Plenty today. of job openings. Yeah, they're probably looking through those old applications. My phone may be ringing if my if my old number still worked. And I said, all right, because I wanted to be a cop and then go to the feds. And I said, I'll just skip the cop part and go to the FBI. And they like lawyers, so I'm gonna go to law school. So that's kind of how I did that. So you get out of law school, you can't get a job as a cop. That's out of college I couldn't get a job as a cop. As a cop. So you go to law school, get out of law school, and you, do you practice as an attorney? I do. First I try to get a job with the feds. <laughs> and I can't get a job with the feds either. At the time I was really close. You know, to, maybe nobody just likes you. How about that? I was really close to getting a job with the DEA at the same time that I got hired by the DA's office here. And, and, and understand this, during that period of time while I'm in law school, my brother and my sister both get hired by the feds. You know? you know, maybe we just need to do the math here. My brother was a Carrollton cop, got hired by Secret Service. My sister was a arson photographer with the Houston Fire Department, got hired by uh, U.S. Customs. And uh, we, her and I actually did some interviews together while I was in law school, and she got hired. And, uh, yeah, I didn't. My brother's still with the Secret Service. My sister since retired from... Uh, so you practiced law? I did. For how many years? Before I became a DA? Uh-huh. Oh, I was less than a year. Mm -hmm. I was out just kind of doing, <clears throat> working here, working there. Did you, did you enjoy being a DA? I did. That was, uh, I tried to tell kind of the new DAs that are assigned to my court. I said, especially some of them that don't seem to really like what they're doing. I said, that was the, that was the most fun I ever had as a lawyer. I was a young lawyer at the time, mm -hmm. but I, I thought my job was great. Mm -hmm. I was I didn't know a lawyer when I became a lawyer. The only lawyers I knew were the guys I became lawyers with from law school. I had no, I could not pick up my phone and say, I'm going to call a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And now I knew 50 and then 50 more at the DA's office. And I was like, I'm a lawyer. This is pretty awesome. <laughs> and so whenever. Were you, uh, were you an arrogant lawyer? You know, people. I mean, you were young, right? I was young and I don't always uh, express my opinions the, the nicest way. I don't. Have well, you're saying intent. you're not diplomatic? You know, Judge, Ill Ill Judge Ramirez said that. He's not very diplomatic. I don't have ill intent, but sometimes the way I say things come across poorly, and my siblings will tell you the same thing about me. And uh, But, no, I had a great time, and it was the most money I'd ever made. You know, I think we were making, like, 38000 or 42000 <laughs> a year. Now, were you, were you married at the time? I was not. Okay, so Blanca wasn't in the picture yeah. at the time. But I had by the dead. way, she's the best thing that ever happened yeah, to you. She is. She's, and by the way, Blanca, great. you owe me for that one. Hey, Judge, Judge Waddell just came in. Do you need to say something to him on camera so that he never forgets it? No, I do not. Okay. I hope he's a good friend of mine. Okay. <laughs> hey, we've got some good stuff for you, buddy. I'm ready. Yeah, it may be such a depressed interview, you'll want to go home for the day. <laughs> so, so what was the one thing about being a DA? that you did not like? Uh, supervision. Some of my supervisors that I had when I was there was probably the, 
you know, just button heads with people because I was, I felt like I was more of a uh, justice first person and it seemed like some of the people I worked with were conviction at all costs. And that was especially uh, during my time as a juvenile prosecutor because mm -hmm. I was, you know, prosecuting kids. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, I'm prosecuting this brother and brother for fighting. I came from a family of six kids. Right. And if we could have gotten prosecuted for fighting. You'd be in jail. I told people I'd be in TYC a long time ago. I'd never become a lawyer. So I had a, I felt like I had more understanding of, uh, of maybe family dynamics and family strife because my family was a blended family growing up. So that led to a little bit more maybe strife than, or button heads than maybe biological families. Did, did you, did you always want to be a judge or did that just come about and you said, I think I'd like to do that. No, I think that kind of uh, presented itself first, probably when I was in law school, whenever I would meet people and present things and just discuss things and do other uh, uh, projects, things like that. They're like, you'd be a good judge one day. And so I, I always thought about it. I never really um, pursued it, you know, in the early times, but I had it in the back of my mind. You know, even when I moved from Denton to Plano, I told my wife, we have to stay in Denton County because one day I'm going to run uh, for judge. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it was uh, it was always something that I thought would be cool to do. You know, out of all the judges that I know, I think if I had to go to court and face a judge, you'd be the one I would not want to go to because you've got this intimidating stare. I saw a post of you on Facebook with a dead stare. Now, I looked at that and I go. Man, I'm glad he ain't staring at me because I just say, just send me to jail. So you've got this intimidating, athletic look. And so as a judge, do you use that? I mean, you know, do you, do you use that to kind of get somebody's attention or, or no? I'm probably, I would say, one of the least intimidating judges in that picture. There was no one in the courtroom that I was staring at whenever. Uh, <laughs> what are you doing, just doing selfies? Well, yeah, I was just, it was my birthday and I was on a break and my siblings kept calling me or people kept calling me on my cell phone. And I was like, this is what I'm doing right now. And uh, <laughs> so I said it with the picture. And uh, yeah, I don't. But what you need to do is you need to send that post to all, uh, when you see your docket, send that post to the folks coming into court that day. Yeah. And it'll be a quick decision. All right, I didn't realize it was that bad of a stare, but I'll work on that. So. Uh, as a judge, now how long have you had the seat? This is my fourth year right now. So, in 2020, how did COVID change uh, the way you did court? It changed in a lot of ways, and you can ask Judge Waddell more of that if you want. But with with regard to us, uh, most of us were at the courthouse every day anyway. The judges were. Very few of us stayed home to work. There might be a day a week that we would stay, and even though we could have stayed home most days. Uh, we couldn't do things in, uh, in person, but we could do things remotely. So we used technology as much as we could. And then we just thought of creative ways to keep our docket moving, mm -hmm. which couldn't be said about a lot of the counties around us. But we kept our docket moving. We did what we could to schedule things and have fewer people in the courtroom so that we weren't uh, yeah. having problems like that. When you have a case where it could go either way. And you have to make the decision. The jury says, you know, the judge is gonna have to make the decision on this. And you get stuck. Who is your go-to judge? Where you pick up the phone, you go, you know, I, got, I need some help on this one. Yeah, and, and that's more along the, the lines of ruling on uh, motions to suppress, things like that. Those are our biggest decisions, I think, because like I said, we don't, very rarely do we do punishment uh, very rarely does uh, the jury can't just punt it back to us. They either make a decision or they don't, right? Mm -hmm. But ours are, are, is more along the lines of do you suppress this or not? That's kind of where we make our biggest decisions because if we suppress like a stop or something, then the case ultimately essentially goes away, right? So yeah, there's a few judges that I have. Some are, you know, the guy I replaced, Judge Bridges. Some are other uh, judges that have left. But I usually, I don't rely on just one. I mean, I might make 
four phone calls, and it could be all four of the judges, all three or four of the judges that left right before I came I got came on. Or even, I always talk to my colleagues too, I'll run it by Judge Waddell, he's right next door to me, so if he's not in, in trial or something, I'll run it by him uh, or some of the other judges that we have up there. You ever go next door to Judge Waddell and go, man, I'll be glad when this day's over. <laughs> yeah, we do that all the time. <laughs> We do. We definitely. There's definitely days that are tougher than others. You know, there's some pretty great days that we have, but there's also some days that. Uh, How'd you get the name Chance? You know, it's, uh, by the way, that, uh, Judge Oliver's first first name is Chance. My middle name is Chance. Oh, got my it. My first name is Leland, and that, that uh, was my I'd dad's go, name. I'd have gone with Chance. Hey, too. that was my dad's name. So <laughs> easy on that. The way I got my name Chance uh, is kind of interesting because uh, I was raised by my father. My Mom left us when we were uh, little. She couldn't handle three kids at the age of 20, I think is by the time. My dad was 20 when I was born. My mom's a little bit younger. But uh, I met her for the first time when I was 22 years old. I just graduated college. I'd torn up my uh, ankle playing basketball, so I was on uh, sick leave mm -hmm. from TDC. Mm -hmm. And so I went to Kansas with my uncle and my sister. My brother, my younger brother, because I have biological sister, biological brother. We all had the same mom. But he had to still work. He was working at the prison too. So his name's Cable. He said, ask mom. I said, do you have anything you want me to ask her? Because we were meeting her for the first time that we remember. He goes, yeah, ask her where I got my name from. Right. I said, I'm going to ask her the same thing. Because we asked our dad. He had no idea. He said, your mom named you. And so I come to find out I was named after uh, John Wayne in uh, Rio Bravo. He was like Sheriff John T. Chance no was his last name. And my brother was named after something, uh, the Ballad of Cable Hogue, because his name's Cable, and my sister's name's Dion. So we all got these interesting names from our mother, and we found out that <laughs> in 1992, when I learned where I got my name from. My parents just said, stick Terry on him. That's, you know, everybody's got, everybody's name's Terry. Just stick Terry on him. Yeah. So, when did you marry Blanca? You know, people, men always talk about marrying up, marrying up. You really married up. I've heard that my whole... 20 years. We got married 20 years ago this month. She is a great asset to you. And you have, uh, you have four kids. I do. And then you have one uh, exchange student right. that you guys took in. It's going to S S going where? SMU? SMU. SMU. Did you go to SMU? I did not. No, you, oh, you went to Sam Houston. Yeah. So, and you guys have come in here often to eat and it's always a joy. I mean, it's always a pleasure when you come in because you have a great family, great wife, great kids, so respectful, funny, funny towards each other. The one thing that you want to teach your kids that you want them to carry through their whole life, what is it? Well, I actually talk to them about this a lot and I actually talk to other little kids or siblings about it too, especially my nephews recently. I just want them to love each other and love God. That's what I want them to do. And that's kind of my legacy. I want kids that love each other and respect each other as siblings because some of my best friends are my siblings. To this day, my brother and sister are my best friends. Oh, is, your, is your mom and dad still alive? They're, neither one of them. My biological mom is still alive. She's my Facebook friend. That's mm -hmm. what I tell people. When she does something crazy on Facebook, I always call her my sister's mom. I was like, your mom did this or your mom did that. No, the, the lady I call my mom passed in 2013 and my dad in 2019. He actually passed away the day I got sworn into office. Were you close to your dad? Very close. You know, Judge, you're a, you're a man of character. I mean, you, a man of principle, a man of character. Everybody ad, ad, adores you and respects you. I don't know about that, but... I might have spoke, I might have stretched out a little bit too far there. The one thing that your father taught you that you, to this day, from time to time, you remember it. Yeah, well, he taught me how to work and make a living no matter what. And, uh, and my wife's still surprised to this day of the things that I can do. Like, how do you know how to do that? Like, I swapped a toilet this weekend. I replaced a tile, did the grout, did the, you know, crown molding around some stuff over the last week. Just things around the house or things on cars mm -hmm. that I could do if, if if I could do it myself, you know, even if it takes me a little while or I have to, you know, look on YouTube, which is what we have now. Mm -hmm. I still have a Chilton manual from how to fix a car uh, 
which we got from my dad's house for that Trans Am I was telling you about. So, you know, how to work hard, fix the things you can do. Mm. And uh, yeah, work hard, never give up. You know, that's kind of, he taught me a work ethic and it's surprising to people to this day. And it's, uh, you can see it in every one of my siblings. Mm -hmm. uh, we're just hard workers and we're, uh, we were raised to work hard. Raised in Houston. We, I hate to even bring that up because we don't even consider Houston part of Texas anymore. You know that, right? Obviously a, an Astros fan. Obviously. And they're in first place. Again, yep. Again, legally. <laughs> we just call it swinging and banging. <laughs> I'm really going to need you to say go Texas Rangers. I'm a Texas, Ranger, uh, Texas Rangers fan this week because they're playing Seattle, and Seattle's oh, kind of oh, chasing yeah, Houston. Uh, yeah. Judge, you're a great judge, and you're great for Texas. You're great for Denton County. And I sure appreciate your friendship. Thank you for being here. We're going to close it out, but you are not going to close it out, nor am I. Terry V on the guitar. Take it, buddy. Mm -hmm.